If you're listening to this on YouTube, this episode is one week delayed. Up-to-date Tech Show But Friendly episodes are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. This is Tech Show But Friendly, Hardware Sugar's podcast, and I'm your host, Anton. And if I don't sound like my usual self, that's for two reasons. One, I'm using a different mic. I usually use my Elgato Wave 1 for these podcasts, but now I'm currently using the MH670. And why am I using the Cooler Master MH670? Because I'm not at home. And why am I not at home? Because I'm in quarantine, because I finally got COVID. So starting off the podcast on a personal note, I've taken myself away from my usual setup because I had to leave the house quickly so as not to infect anybody else. So I'm currently using the Asus ProArt laptop as my primary computing communications device and the Cooler Master MH670. So basically, the computing hardware that I could remove from my house and bring it to where I'm quarantining now. The ProArt is actually pretty good and Asus lent us the laptop because we're coming up with a video on how to be a content creator if you're constantly on the go. And I wanted to test what it's like to have a laptop that's geared towards content creators and content production. So Asus kindly lent us one. And the timing couldn't have been more perfect. Well, it's never really good timing to get COVID. But at least when I had to vacate my usual setup quickly, there was a relatively powerful computer laptop on hand. So thanks so much, Asus, for that one. But my voice does sound a little weird. I mean, my voice is always a little weird to begin with, but I think the cough has kind of crept into my voice. I don't know if it, it, it sounds a little congested, I think, on playback. Thankfully, though, the symptoms have not been that bad. They've all been mild. So I'm just more concerned about making sure that no one else in my family will get infected from me. Hence the quarantine. But moving on to actual tech news, we start out with the big headline for this week, the hack of Gcash. If you remember last week's episode, we talked about how the PNP got hacked and the DICT spokesperson was like, no, no, the DICT didn't get hacked, which is true. There was no hack in the sense that there was no unauthorized entry into a security system. And it's similar, that's the same situation we have here for Gcash. There was no unauthorized entry. Well, there was unauthorized entry, but it wasn't forcible entry, kumbaga. And that's why I, <laughs> I, I like how all of these PR guys, whether they're from government or from the private, they're very, they're very anxious about being clear that, wait, wait, this wasn't a hack. And it's really just a matter of semantics at this point. It's not very useful information to say that, oh, it wasn't a hack because there wasn't forcible entry. But in the case of Gcash, as interestingly like what happened to Linus, let's say a month ago when unauthorized persons gained access to his Google account or the YouTube channel's account. In the case of Gcash, based on the info that they're releasing, the affected individuals, the affected users clicked on a link sent via text. And when you click on that link, the perpetrator or the scammer on the other end is able to see what you're typing into your phone. So they're able to get details. And with that, once you log on to your Gcash normally, like you do have, and with that, when you log on to Gcash normally, like you use your normal PIN, they're able to see the PIN and then they're able to link the account to a different device. And that's how they were able to gain access. To be fair, yes, not really a hack, more like a phishing episode. And that is what the Gcash spokesperson or corporate communications, whatever, and indeed, when you're clicking on links, it's just not very good IT security behavior. I'm super interested, though, to figure out how they were able to send a link because Globe in particular has been very anal the past few months about restricting all links, even legitimate links, anything with a URL type of Globe would label as spam and not send it. But apparently, these users did get a link. They clicked on it. And then the perpetrator on the other end had access to all of their keystrokes and whatnot. And that's how they were able to siphon out money from the affected Gcash accounts. For perspective, Globe says that around 1,000 accounts were affected by this. And there are over 80 million Gcash accounts. So a very small number of users were affected. Globe is quick to point out that no one's money was lost because they immediately closed off the transfers or nullified the transfers. And this happened Monday as part of a greater scheme, it seems, to transfer money to 
particular accounts because one account in East West was tagged as well as one account in AUB where the proceeds of all of these transfers were being sent to. So bottom line, there was no hack. It seems a failure of the user and no money was lost. You do kind of feel for Globe because on one hand, it really wasn't their fault. This was all not great IT behavior or IT usage from the end user. But on the same time, if you're the end user, that's very little comfort to you that you're being told that, hey, you know, it's your fault, but we'll take care of cleaning up your mess. And Gcash was down or a lot of its services were down well into the week. We were trying to move some money legitimately from our Gcash account to pay our suppliers and we just couldn't for several days because the system was under maintenance or, you know, they had to redo or undo these transfers. There is a definite bad guy here, and those are the bad actors, the scammers, the ones sending out those links, the ones siphoning money from innocent users to their own accounts. And that's really how a few bad apples spoil it for the rest of us. I mean, 99% of all Gcash users are legitimate, but they're the ones who get affected when things like this happen. To be honest, not blaming Globe. Also, like I didn't blame the PNP in last week's episode, IT is hard, IT on scale is even harder, and perhaps the most hardest or the most difficult portion of the whole IT sequence is the end user. You know, you tell the end user, don't click here, don't believe in that free RAM download, don't give out personal information. It's the digital, I mean, giving out that information is a digital equivalent of taking off all your clothes and running naked in the mall. That's something that nobody does. But clicking on strange links, giving out personal information, posting personal information, like, oh, here's my driver's license with all of those little details. I'm going to post it on my Facebook. We have a lot to catch up on in figuring out the new digital sanitation or best practices, hygienic digital best practices for end users. In GPU News, Colorful is offering a trade-in program and that's one of the most requested programs we've ever come across in Hardware Sugar. A lot of people ask us, do you guys, Hardware Sugar, can we send in our whole hardware to you and then you'll give us credit for it and then we'll, then we can buy new hardware. Unfortunately, we just can't at this point. As a small retailer, our economics of scale just aren't there. I mean, to be honest, we we're not even barely making it. We're in the red. So our economies of scale are not there yet, even for normal retail operations, let alone to carry on a trade-in program. But Colorful, the brand, a brand that we like, a brand that has sponsored us, and a brand that we carry in the shop and that we recommend to our customers, is offering a rebate program, a trade-in program, which is great. A lot of our car companies here now do that. Naging uso na sa atin. Although that kind of practice was prevalent in the U.S. like decades <laughs> before we finally adopted it here. But the catch is, unfortunately, the colorful trade-in program is not, is not applicable to us. It's only applicable to users in China. If there are any plans to have it apply to other countries, other territories, I will ask our colorful contact and let you know. But for now, perhaps the second best option, if you're a Hardware Sugar customer, we only offer this service to Hardware Sugar customers, is that you can send old hardware to us. It doesn't need to be hardware that you bought from us. It can be any old computer hardware that you want to sell. And we're going to keep it in the shop and we're going to post it on our secondhand list, which does get a lot of traction. A lot of people visit it to look for good deals. You still set the price and we will send you the entire price if we're if we manage to sell it correct, if we manage to sell it, so we don't get a cut at all. A bit difficult, honest. It's really a bit of a hassle, to be honest, to maintain the secondhand parts list, especially because the shop doesn't get a cut and we get a lot of requests. Oh, can you check out this secondhand case? Can you see if all the screws are there? Does this RAM have this particular chip or something? To be honest, the dealing with the secondhand requests can even take up more of our time. And the inventory, we have to make sure that we remember who owns which part and how much they list it for and things like that. The logistics can get overwhelming for a project that we earn zero pesos from. And it's even a negative, again, 
because we have to spend so many man hours on it. But we like doing the secondhand list because it's something concrete that we feel we can do to help the environment, for one. That's less e-waste. And number two, it's also good for the consumers. Because a lot of secondhand parts are still very good and their performance is still very good. Wag kayo maniwala sa mga kumpanya na palagi nagsasabi na, oh, you need the latest and the greatest. And it's also good for the sellers because if they want to upgrade later on or if for whatever reason they don't need the computer anymore, then at least they can recoup some of the costs that they put into their computers. From CPUs, we move on to CPUs with the surprising news from Intel that they will be foregoing the classic i3, i5, i7, i9. Or the more precise terms are the core i and an insert number. But in a new announcement, Intel mentioned that Moving forward with Meteor Lake, which is their 14th gen, they would be calling it the Core Ultra. And it's not entirely clear if they will be using the same naming conventions as the i3, 5, 7, and 9, whether it will be completely something else. And it's also, the announcement was a bit confused because it wasn't an actual announcement. I think it was just mentioned in an earnings call or something. So sort of like as an aside that for Meteor Lake, that that for Meteor Lake, only i3 and i5 chips are coming out, which would be really weird. I mean, when they come out with the next gen, they usually populate the entire series from the 3, 5, 7, and 9. So it's unclear to me what this news means that only 3 and 5 will be available for Meteor Lake. Meteor Lake is not a big jump for Intel. It's rumored to still use the current LGA 1700 socket. So that's the same socket for the 11th gen, the current... So that's a socket for the 12th gen, the current 13th gen, and the upcoming 14th gen, which should be out by the end of the year. So still a lot of uncertainty on what's going on there, whether what products this naming change will be implemented on, and what kind of products can we expect from Meteor Lake? Because from 12 to 13, there wasn't a big difference. There wasn't a lot of improvement, but that wasn't bad per se because the 12th gen was already pretty good. They just kind of built on a good thing with the 13th gen. And it's nice that you have motherboards that were still intergenerationally compatible. We had a lot of customers buy Intel 13th gen, but with a Z690, saving a bit of money instead of having to go with the Z790 instead of having to go with DDR5 because Intel 12th and 13th gen still allowed you to use DDR4 unlike AMD's latest platform AM5 which does require DDR5 which is a bit more expensive than DDR4. So confusing aside from Intel, they are not doing that great in terms of profit also. I understand that they're going to be cutting more jobs their CPUs, though, have been pretty good, starting from the 12th gen onwards. It's really sort of going to toe value for money, and performance-wise against AMD. And of course, if we have Team Blue news, we also need to have Team Red news, and it's also bizarre news for Team Red. AMD announced that they will be producing the 3000G CPU chips again. So we're talking about the 3200G and the 3400G. No news yet if these will be the classic chips from 2019, I think, was when they came out. Or if they will be slightly upgraded. And the speculation is that AMD is producing these new old chips. <laughs> because they need to get rid of old stock of motherboards. And actually, it's been weird because it's quite difficult already to find X570 boards. So for top-end AM4 builds, X570 is becoming quite rare but to jive in with the speculation what probably still has a lot of stock are the really old boards let's say the b450s a320s and amd in a bid to help liquidate these old motherboards needs to find a cpu that could be paired although the g series from the 5000 series are pretty good and they are compatible with the b450s and a320s at least i at least that is the case if I remember correctly. There's a little bit of confusion sometimes. I, I forget which ones are not compatible. But I think if my brain hasn't fogged up from COVID, all of those are still compatible with the old motherboards B450, A320. All you need is a BIOS update. So interesting to 
So interesting move, kind of bizarre actually from AMD. Why not just produce more of the 5000 series CPUs, reduce their price? It's also unclear what price these new old 3000G chips will have. And back in their time, they were pretty good value for money, but you know, they are almost four years old and we're not even sure if they'll come with any updates. But AMD has confirmed that yes, we will be pumping out more of those old chips. Lastly, in gaming news, Indonesia and Singapore were the title finalists for the gold medal in Valorant for the Southeast Asian Games currently happening. In Singapore won, but with some controversy as the Indonesian team pulled out, they refused to play. So they were already engaged in the match, but then there were some technical difficulties and then the match dragged on for 11 hours, they had to stop it. I don't know, the reports I read were a bit confused. But ultimately, the Indonesian team pulled out because they accused the Singaporean team of cheating. Now, I'm no Valorant expert, so again, it's a bit hard for me to parse the news. But there was one particular agent in Valorant which has the ability to set up cameras or viewing points. And the Indonesian team alleged that the Singaporeans used that even though that was banned, even though that wasn't allowed. And there were screenshots of the Indonesians specifically asking the organizers, like, you know, is this allowed? And the organizers saying no. So the Indonesians pulled out and the Singaporeans won by default. Although in a later announcement, at least in the news release that I saw, it was declared that the Indonesians would be declared also co-winners of the gold medal. So super confusing. Again, I'm not super big into the esports scene or Valorant, but I always try to keep track of how mainstream games are becoming, the difficulties in having them become mainstream, and the rules and leagues, and the difficulty those leagues have implementing those rules. Although I would have thought with a computer game, as long as, as it wasn't a hack or you know outside software, anything running within the game would be allowed. I'm also not sure what happened to our Valorant team, but apparently it was Indonesia and Singapore who were fighting for the gold medal, and Singapore has won by default. That's all the news I want to cover for this week. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Tech Show But Friendly. I apologize for the audio quality. Hopefully next week, I'll be back at my usual place, with my usual hardware, with my usual voice. Till then, thanks again for watching. Stay safe. Have a good weekend or have a good day whenever you're listening to this. Oh yes, and before I go, I do want to point out that Hardware Sugar is having an extreme May sale. CPUs, GPUs, and MOBOs, all of those three hardware components, all of our stock is at super reduced price. Like, talagang katabing katabin na niya yung dealer price. Sobrang lit na lang no markup namin. We're doing this because I just wanted to experiment on how big a burst in volume would be if we lowered the price super low. In most cases, lugi na kami dito because the markup can't cover all of our additional expenses like our labor costs, our rent costs. But again, just an experiment. And you guys will benefit from that experiment because these prices really are super good. You can check them out on our website. Thanks for lending me your ear.